about the world of literary publishing and agency. My pleasure. Thank okay. you for having it's me. Okay, it's really and my pleasure. I really love that party you all put on and uh, about the South African book. It was really good, a great vibe. Thank you. That was very exciting. Mac Marahaj was in prison with Mandela for 10 years on Robbins Island. Yeah, I know. And was tortured and brutalized and really has a great sense of humanity still. Right, yeah. And I was very pleased to have a book party for him, inviting all the press, and I'm so happy you were one of well, the Well, I'm happy I was one too. Highlights of the party. And welcome very much to Conversation. A pleasure to welcome to the program Karen Gantz Zaylor. And she's a literary agent, and she happens to be fortunate enough, if I may say so, I think I may have got myself in deep trouble already, because when you, somebody gets married, you usually congratulate the groom. But she's fortunate enough to be married to a wonderful fellow, Eric Zaylor, yes. who uh, is a, uh, a, a, an executive at uh, Laurel and so forth. And they put on a book party recently I was invited to by Viking and others. And she is a literary agent, and we're going to talk about her and about the business of uh, literary publishing and the agency's role in that, agent's role in that. And Karen, welcome really very much to Conversation in Manhattan Network Public Access. Thank you very much, a pleasure. We start off these programs. We have 58 minutes, right? So mm -hmm. we start these programs off, I've uh, been doing it so long, it just seems like forever. But we started off by asking you to share your background, where you were born and raised, and that's a way to wade into a conversation about you and about the things that you're concerned with. But could you share where you were born and raised? Educate a little of that, I please. I certainly can. I was born in Harrison, New York, in Westchester County, New York. Mm -hmm. Uh, in an unusual family in the sense that my father had gone to Harvard Law School, uh -huh. my mother went to Vassar. There were very high educational standards in our home. Uh -huh. Many of our peers' parents had not gone to those kind of schools and had those kind of experiences. You mean other parents in the community, uh, other people in the community, you mean, or what? You in mean your, your yes. family was uh, educationally yeah. motivated, Mo right? Very motivated. It was definitely part of the background of our family focusing on education. Did it go back to your grandparents as well? No, they were immigrants. My they grandfather were immigrants came. from the Pale or something? Yes, or? he um, came uh, avoiding the Holocaust, fortunately. Yeah. Came all by himself. His yeah. parents all perished. Yeah. But he came here all by himself on a boat with nothing and waited on bread lines. Yeah. And um, he actually became very successful. He had a company called Ralph Fabrics, and then he made a lot of money in the stock market. Uh -huh. And um, he wasn't educated, nor mm. was my grandmother. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, who went to uh, Harvard Law School, his, his parents were immigrants also uh -huh. from Poland and Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when my father got into Harvard Law School, his mother asked him if he was going to Howard. Uh, Howard, he had, right, didn't yeah, know, right, know that right. place. Before. Harvard was quite a it's, a, it's a, it's a plum to go to Harvard because you're just all set because that's, a, that's, a, that's the best law school, I think, to go to. I don't no, I think it is. Harvard it's a ticket still. for life. It's a uh, ticket for life. My husband went there too. It was a criteria. I had to find a husband who went to Harvard Law School. Yeah, I know. My dad was law. My yes. dad went to law, but he, I was in Michigan. Uh huh. And uh, mm -hmm. he was in the class of six, 28, 26. Uh huh. And he had Leopold and Loeb in his class. Did the two he really? people who killed the Bobby Franks because they thought they were so above the laws. Uh, rightfully so because of their elevated intelligence that they did not have to adhere by the laws of like murder and so forth. They really believed that. They it's were in his class. Isn't that a remarkable thing? And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, was the first woman, God bless her, to ever graduate from the University of Michigan Medical College, 1888. That is outstanding. And she could hardly practice at all. We've come a long way, haven't a we? A long way. I'm sure in her day everything. she had to beg and scream to get into medical school. It was school. terrible. Well, she, I'm she, sure had, she was the she only one. She had to one. do research and that mm -hmm. sort of thing because they wouldn't, because women weren't supposed to be medical doctors. You could be a teacher or a nurse or something, but things are getting a lot better. What I a think. trendsetter! Oh, oh yes, almost 50 percent of law school classes, many law school classes, are women today. It's I really happened to look at the New York Times uh, Almanac the other day, and I was just looking at education, and the percentage of the people that were even graduating from high school was less than 20 percent in the 1900. Now everybody does, everybody. and even college and so forth is extending out. And then you went to school where? I went to Vassar, Vassar. College oh. and I transferred to the University of Pennsylvania. So I oh. took a lot of law courses and courses in the Wharton School. Yeah, uh, Wharton, yeah. Lawrence yes. Klein was there. Yeah. Yes. Uh huh. So you, you 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 went to Vassar undergraduate life? I went to Vassar for two years and then I transferred to University of Pennsylvania. So there was undergraduate. What did you study then? Or I guess you begin to Politics. major. Politics. Politics right? and urban sociology. And did you know you were going to go in the law? 
Because you're an attorney, we I, forgot I, to mention I, I you. was always interested in law. I uh -huh. took courses at University of Pennsylvania Law School. As an undergraduate, you were allowed to do that. Okay. So you got an exposure to all kinds of law, tort law, constitutional law. I was always interested in that. Um, I love negotiating contracts, which mm -hmm. is how I got into this business. Yeah, right. You know, right. I love the concept of justice and equity. Mm -hmm. And um, I really enjoy... Um, I, negotiating. That's mm. what I really enjoy doing and that's one of the reasons I do all the legal work for my clients also because yeah. I, I really enjoy that process. And you're, 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 did you, sp in, in medicine they specialize, everyone specialized in oncology or whatever. Do they do so in law also? I mean because it's a professional school do you, you get a basic grounding and then you specialize in one aspect of the law or how does that work with the attorneys There is of no subspecialty as, uh -huh. as if you were an undergraduate uh -huh. getting a major. You can take a bulk of courses in a particular subspecialty, for example, intellectual property, entertainment law, things like that. Um, when I graduated in 81, it wasn't offered with such diversity as it is today. Uh -huh. So more people just got a general legal background. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting to me is, you know, one of my authors is Floyd Abrams. Who's yes, you know, Mr. Mr. First Amendment. I yes, tell you, he's grand Mr. fellow, First yeah. Amendment. He's with that Cahill Company. Cahill Gordon and Ryan Dell. Major he's firm. He's been there yeah. forever. Yeah. And, um, Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I would say, one yeah. One person who stayed in a, a law firm at one place for a long time. Uh -huh. And defended the, the First Amendment. Defended the First Amendment. He yeah. was famous for the Pentagon paper case. Right. Uh, uh -huh. The Sullivan. The was he involved in the Sullivan thing with the New York Times? New York Times. No, but he was very interested in that case. He was Sullivan yeah, versus right. United States. Yeah, uh -huh. New York Times. He's represented the New York Times, ABC, and um, pen many people go to his law firm just to be able to work for him. It's mm. a very coveted area of the law. It's a small specialty. Right. And many people want to do that. Very important one. A to very, protect very important the one. Uh, First Amendment is a very important part of our Constitution. Right? Very important part of our yeah. Constitution. Yeah, and, and he's, he's, d he's done that mightily. And you are a publisher, or you are an agent for him, and he's yes, got a I book am. out now. What is it's it? It's called Speaking Freely. Speaking Freely, right. It's about a lot of the cases he's represented. Mm -hmm. For example, the Brooklyn Museum, it was a situation where Giuliani felt um, the street museum artists. shouldn't get oh, oh, yeah. funding because there was offensive art in yes. an exhibit. He said that bad art. Right, and so <laughs> it's dangerous it when the politicians are telling us what's bad art. Clearly, a denial of the artist, you know, First Amendment. Uh -huh. But there were issues that the museum was getting funding from the city. Yeah, and. Uh, Mr. Abrams prevailed. Mm -hmm. He's been in a lot of very, very interesting cases, mm -hmm. campaign financing, mm -hmm. things such as that. I was going back to law school, which made me think his son, Dan Abrams, is um, TV. managing editor mm -hmm. of uh, MSNBC. And mm -hmm. what always I found most staggering is his first job at Core TV, he covered the O.J. Simpson case. Uh -huh. And very few people out of law school really had that kind of depth of understanding uh -huh. of the legal situation. They do very well in school, but when you leave, you really need more training, which is why many people go to big law firms to get seasoned as lawyers. Uh -huh. You really need to put it into practice, yeah. whereas in medical school, as you said, there are residencies, internships, so yeah. you get hands-on right? practice yeah. built into their practice. Uh -huh, uh -huh. What we have to do now in the legal field is you have to um, have continuing legal education credits and also in order to maintain your bar membership. Mm -hmm. So I frequently take seminars mm -hmm. uh, in order to keep up with different areas of the law, even if it's not an area you practice. So and that's the law is thing. a many splendored thing and it varies over time. And um, the rule of law is an extremely important concept if we're going to have civilized society, is it not? Yes, it is. That's uh, one of our I goals. mean, it truly is. But and then I did a program a couple days, a couple of programs ago with somebody, and I asked whether they used to have. I mean, how do we deal with it through time or when there's threats? Um, like we used to have chattel slavery, and they had the fugitive slave laws back mm -hmm. in 1840. And if yes. fugitive slave came into your presence, you would have to turn them in, or you're breaking the law. The law can be an ass. And the law can be a thing that serves the very rich and powerful over the mass of the people also, or maybe to the detriment of the people, mm -hmm. and only for the benefit of the few. 
So there has to be a, it has to serve to vouchsafe the integrity of the system, but it also has to have an opening on equity or an opening upon expanding opportunity for more all the time. So it's a very care, it's a very important part of the organization of a civilized, civil, civilized it order. It is, and it? as you said, um, it made me think of the OJ case. Yeah. Um, OJ had a significant legal team. Mm -hmm. Many people are not very happy. What was that fellow's name? Uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. And um, actually, one of the books I represented was yeah. a Cato Kalin book. Okay. Which uh, it was a very interesting phenomenon in the publishing business. When something, some public event mm -hmm. is thrust in front of the public, uh -huh. there are massive books that come out. Yeah. They get quite large advances. This was a very significant half a million dollar advance. Often they don't earn out. Mm -hmm. So unless you're a lead book, there was a glut of books on that topic right. at the time, as there were with 9-11 books, uh -huh. a glut of books. Mm -hmm. So if you're very fortunate to be one of the few books that are read extensively, mm -hmm. there's a significant amount of money um, that a publisher will make, yeah. an author will make, mm -hmm. and a, an agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best way to find projects as an agent is to read the paper, read magazines, read things you like, go to lectures, find someone whose work you really like, approach them, mm -hmm. and see if you can represent them. And I really think, from an agent's point of view, the best projects I feel I've initiated myself. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. example, Alec Baldwin. I yeah. um, mm -hmm. He's a great advocate mm -hmm. for wonderful causes. I met him at an event for the people for the American Way. I was representing the president of that organization. Mm -hmm. He talked to me about what he wanted to accomplish. He wrote a book called Surviving Divorce. It's coming out next year because he really wants to change the system. Mm -hmm. the, the system of divorce? The system of divorce. He feels that the laws haven't caught up with s the society's focus on the fact that fathers are more active in their children's lives than ever before. Then historically has been the case? Yeah, absolutely. There's always oh. a presumption that a woman was better able to take care of his children, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. her children. Yeah. So today, I'm sure you know, you see fathers going to games. My son is in the lacrosse team at uh, the Riverdale Country School. Mm -hmm. And um, I went up to see him in a game. I would say there must have been five men, all decked in suits and ties, coming for that one hour, going back. And it's quite a dent of their schedule coming from New York City all the way to watch a game for an hour and go back to the office. Oh, and yeah. um, mm -hmm. that was true of women lawyers, too. But in the past, you would not have seen as many men participating in such an activity. So, so I think yeah. it's very exciting. And that, that changes the dynamic of the divorce system in that? Yeah. Yes, because have, yeah. although the standard in many states has been the best interest of the child, that hasn't always been the case. Because there was a presumption that a woman was better able. Many women are much more able to yeah, do that. Yeah, custody was almost always routinely given to the woman, right. wasn't it? Yeah. But things are starting to change, and mm. I think one of the things Alec Baldwin wants to do is bring that to people's attention, mm -hmm. testify in Congress, hold seminars around the country, mm -hmm. so people understand what the laws are, what they can do to improve their situations. And, and have the law adjust to the realities of the times as they're, Bobby Dylan said, the times they are changing, That's new right. things are emerging, so we've got to keep tabs with that new, that new capabilities that are there. So back to the fugitive slave thing, I mean, it would have been a conundrum for somebody who was an abolitionist to turn somebody in, but they would be breaking the law if they didn't. Or if you were in Nazi That's Germany mm -hmm. and you had this absurd thing going on with the Nazis about the Jews, and a Jew came into your uh, bailiwick, you would be duty bound by the law to turn them in so they could go to Auschwitz. You would now, be. you'd have a real moral dilemma, but the law then, in the hands of uh, malviolent forces and so forth, can be a, a real problem, and yet the law itself has to safeguard the interests of the already well-established within the society, don't you think? I do. As one part of what their overall charge is, the, the purpose of the, the law. Do you understand I think, what I'm yes, saying? Yes, I do, but I and think it you made it. It, 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 uh, it um, evolves. You made a very good point. I'm very active. I care deeply about Israel. Mm. Those, you do, okay. The example you gave, mm -hmm. 
about non-Jews having to turn over Jews during the Holocaust. I or think slaves those are during tests, the, slave. the same, yeah. same thing. The same They're thought. tests of your moral fiber. Uh -huh. Some very off, very rarely are we tested in life in such a way, right. uh -huh. where you really are risking your own life for something you believe so strongly in, and to and save the one life are, is to the, save the world. Yeah, and the authorities are telling you it's your duty to turn them in. It's the law. It's your duty. It's your patriotic duty to do that. Most people want to be patriotic to the system that they got identity from and so forth. They do, but as you know and I know, many times the law isn't fair. And you That's have to what I was getting it. at. The yeah. question is constitutionality, mm -hmm. question is fairness, mm -hmm. and in often, for example, in Alec Baldwin's case, there's a public forum. Yeah. You can write a book about it. You uh, can testify. Right. That's in important. In a situation mm -hmm. such as the Holocaust mm -hmm. or during the fugitive slave issue, mm -hmm. you were tested as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I give so much credit. I always say to my, what would you do in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. And I think there are situations where you have to draw a line personally. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Nazis were demonstrating in Skokie, Illinois. I remember that, Remember yeah. that case? And it was a primarily a Jewish community. Uh -huh. I think Alan Dershowitz is a fabulous lawyer. You like Alan? I do. Okay, uh -huh. I think he's a great writer. Uh -huh. He's very effective. I know him. Mm -hmm. But I personally was offended for a Jew to go represent the Nazis. He did? In the town. He did. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I uh -huh. personally felt I would have drawn the line there. Mm -hmm. Yes, someone needs to represent them, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel it should be a Jewish advocate because mm -hmm. I felt it made their case even stronger. Mm -hmm. And while one can argue everyone deserves representation, mm -hmm. I feel there are situations in life where you just have to draw the line, mm -hmm. and you say I can't do that. Do I you think that? Do you think we, we've gone? I'm just uh, philosophically and everything. We, uh, that uh, do you think we live in a elementally just world? I saw President Carter, and there was a there was a uh, interview that was done. A, a former president, and somebody asked him, on "Do we live uh, on his new book?" It wasn't that. It was on mm -hmm. another issue. But it, it essentially, the question came: Do we live in an elementally just world? If you, if you lived in a totally just world, there wouldn't be the pro. But he said, of course not. Half the population is starving. We do not live in a just world. We live in a world that serves the rich and powerful. And so if you do, then you come up. We had a, a moral testing when Martin King came along, or Malcolm X. And it really tested the, moral, the, the morality of, uh, in the civil rights thing and that. And then there was COINTELPRO, and the government can be uh, suppressing new ideas in order to safeguard the established role, I mean the established pattern. Well, you I know? think that's why many of us try to get certain types of people in office who will be less repressive than others. I uh -huh. think that's the p opportunity in terms of a civil society that each individual has a right to make a choice in that way. Uh -huh. And there are people in the current administration who have had a repressive regime and I think if you want to make a statement you have to fight it, <coughs> and you have to be an advocate, and you have to do something to try to change the system uh -huh. in a way that we are able to do. But you have the system, but the system itself is, is uh, malleable. It can be changed, it equity, be changed. this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It can be changed, and the system itself is as good as we can do without qualitative change. They had, they had, um, 700 years, 800 years of ruling dynastic families in Europe under the feudal period. Everybody got their identity by that. Mm -hmm. Then along came a Scottish Enlightenment, Hume and all that, and they signed the Declaration of Independence. They started the United States. And then that in influ industrial revolution was coming. The times were changing. That influenced the Miserable France, and they cut off Louis the Sixteenth head. He was a representative of the feudal order whose time had passed, and it was destined to have a new order. Do you think the system that's in place now that operates Spaceship Earth is one that has got the elements required for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the liberation or for the full participation of the human society within an appropriate context? Or do we lack vision in terms of the basic principles by which we try to operate this world? And if we don't, how are we going to get the new ideas uh, able to be able to 
make a transformation to a just world order. Well, you mentioned Louis the Sixteenth. Mm -hmm. I just wrote an op-ed piece <laughs> in the New, New York Sun just, just happened to about uh, Sarkozy. Okay. Oh because yeah. Because there was an old staggering. Um old world order in yeah. France for many years. The economy is staggering. Mm -hmm. They weren't really a forceful part of the European Union. Yeah. They sided with Iraq uh -huh. during the war. Uh -huh. The people have chosen change. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. From a Jewish point of view, mm -hmm. 7,000 Jews left for America and 3,000 left for Israel because of a lot of anti-Semitic acts. Uh -huh. Desecration of cemeteries, synagogues, mm -hmm. and many Jews had chosen to leave, mm -hmm. even though they felt an allegiance to France. That mm -hmm. was their country. Mm -hmm. Sarkozy is offering hope to many people. To many, yeah. Not just Jews, uh -huh. other people, uh -huh. other immigrants. Yeah, he's right wing. A he's a right wing kind of thing, in line with Bush and so forth. And will line up with Bush in the American order. Well, and I don't yeah. know about Bush necessarily, oh. or, or but the, I think the system, the system in place. American, yeah, I'd say the, American the, order. Rather the American-led order. order is appropriate to mm -hmm. what the planet requires. We have things going on down in South America, Chavez. The United States of the United States of America has never been in lower esteem than it is at the moment by a vast number of people in the world. And the world system doesn't well serve mm. the masses. But that's an issue. That's getting off on other issues and so forth. And what we ought to be talking about is literary agency and Good. so forth. Good. And let's do that. That had to do with, uh, we used to talk this with my father. He was a lawyer. We talked about the law and the evolution of it and so forth. So it's a theme interesting to me and so forth. Well, it's but very interesting to me. Yeah, but you are a literary agent. Yes, when did I you am. pick up on that? When did you first start that? I practiced law. About 15 years ago, I really decided that I preferred helping people develop their books. Okay. I happen to love to cook. Okay. And it's like taking oh. raw ingredients yeah. and creating a cake or uh. creating a masterpiece of right. some way. Mm -hmm. To me, when someone comes to me with a germ of an idea mm, and right. I can end up with a sacred book. Uh -huh. um, okay, I, let's show a book. You got a book. Okay. If I put it on my knee, I think maybe the camera is set to come in on it. I wrote a book you wrote called this Taste book. of New York. You wrote this before you were doing agency work, or you did the Just at the beginning. At the beginning, right At the okay. beginning, when I was starting off. Okay. I learned to cook in France. I lived in France. Boy, they know in how Lyon, to. In Lyon, which was mm. the gastronomic center of Europe at uh -huh. that time. And um, I really learned to cook Lyonnaise food, and I had many lessons uh -huh. and cooked a lot. And I was always fascinated how restaurant food looks so much better than even really good excellent cooks could make. French what really it? know how to cook. They do. They? Yeah. they trained the America, these great American chefs today. Mm -hmm. in, they, the American chefs learned classic food, but they went beyond. Mm -hmm. And what, that's very, very exciting. So yeah, what I did is I went into book, yeah. each restaurant uh -huh. and made each dish with each of the great chefs of New York. You lucky thing. I you mean, had the best food going. Huh? I had the best food uh -huh. and the finest ingredients uh -huh. and wonderful chefs to work with. Uh -huh. And then I wrote another book okay, after let's, that. Okay, let, let them see this also. You're really called, involved uh, in the super chef. gastronomic stuff. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. on all the best restaurant recipes of the great American chefs. I was really fascinated that th the reason I called it super chefs is chefs today um, jet set between multiple restaurants, they market products, they are on television shows. Yeah, they're stars. The like, yeah. They're stars. Like, ba like, uh, like Tiger Woods. Yes, something. they yeah, are. Well. They really have been elevated to that kind of level and that's a new phenomenon in our Who's country. Who's the greatest chef in the history of the world? Escoffier? Or is there such? Do we have it? Michelangelo was really good in the arts. But you in know, the world of chef, it's an art. It is. And There's is there a great Alain artist Ducasse, of all time? But you know something? I, because I spent a lot of time with the American chefs, would yeah. definitely say that there are a few fabulous, I mean, there's so many, but Jean-Georges Van Gerichten is one great chef, Danielle Boulou. There's so, there are many, many. There's no Michelangelo. There. Like, when it comes to my name as a, as a, a nit, nit, nitwit in the area, mm -hmm. I think Escoffier. He, he was a great like Michelangelo, a trendsetter of his day. A trendsetter, yes, he yeah, was. but a, a, an artist. Mm -hmm. And you can measure it. Is it a thing, a movable feast? Mr. Hemingway said, but uh, eating and the taste. Is it a thing where you like some people don't like escargot, where there's a taste thing? Is there a standard by which it can be judged when something is really good, or is taste uh, 
no accounting for taste. Well, as they say, shaka, songu, everyone has his taste, but there is a, mo a level at which oh. food, you know, rises to a certain level mm. of stardom, of delicacy, flavor, presentation is very important, uh -huh. melding flavors. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a whole event. Yeah, it's a whole it. event. And, and when and these American chefs first came out, mm -hmm. many people thought that the cuisine was not here to stay but the, it's been tested and it's been proven that it is here to stay. I've represented a lot of chefs. American cuisine. Cuisine. American it's a very many contemporary American cuisine. It's a very many splendid thing it because it goes all the way thing. from roast beef to gumbo. It I mean, and anything. wild rice with the Indians who were here and so on. How do we differ? Uh, you know, if you think of you think of English, well, let's not think English because they boil steak for crying out loud. But to think of the French and Their you get cuisine has it's got a much to be desired. It is a much Beyond to be desired. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Puddings and uh, pies. Yeah, they, they, but and, but the French, but you 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 have that. So you have you have uh, you have different kinds, and you have different kinds uh, around uh, around the world. I'm not sure what it is I was getting at them, but you just you, you know it's like. Uh, um, sauces, for example, sauces. Sauces. There are uh, classic French sauces. Yeah. Uh, Bordeaux sauce. Right. Um, veal stock right. sauce, veal sauces, chicken stock, but and they 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 add it with the natural juices. The American, the contemporary American, yeah. What food is, is American often cuisine? Lighter. What is it's American? Lighter. It's what is bringing, it? They often bring in Asian ingredients. Oh. They um, a lot of it's sculptural. Sculpture. It's 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 a combination of things as there are with French. Like if you have to dissect what. French cuisine is there are lots of elements that yeah. add to it. A lot it. of butter. A lot of butter. A lot but, of sauce. But the yeah. French are yeah. lessening their butter content, uh. even though all those books about why French live so long and they have foie gras. And they got to drink red that wine. glass of wine every day. They live for longer. It's glass good. Glass of yeah. wine every day. Wouldn't it be good if I were God? I think hot fudge Sundays would be good for you. You know, and the good things would. But I was saying, what would be a, a characteristic of, of? I have arguments like this. American cuisine, hamburger. What well, is the characteristic? First of all, I'm talking about contemporary cuisine. It's yeah. not a hamburger. It's not a hamburger. No, it's a light sauce. A light it, sauce. The presentation's beautiful. They incorporate ingredients from other cultures. For example, many people use ginger. For example, if you go to a restaurant like Danielle Boulou and you get a carrot soup, it's going to have a little ginger in it, garlic and ginger. Now, that's a new ingredient mm. that might not have been added previously. Mm -hmm. But it is. It's hard to define it the way it is. It's, you can define French food in a way. Mm. There are certain things like escargot, quenelle, uh, souffles. I make a lot of souffles for my family. Or you and have Japanese. Japanese have everything. Chinese food. It's incorporating you know, it, a lot it, it, of those things um, and elements into yeah, American but cooking. Like Indian cuisine is sort of distinctive. Uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, Chinese right. is uh, that. But American seems to me, I'm not sure. I'm from the Midwest, and mm -hmm. I think it's like roast beef or something, you know, and it's like a standard or a turkey or right, something. Right, that's it's not the kind of American food I'm really talking about. Oh, you're though. talking about the high... These kinds of things in here, I'll show you. Okay. Let me give you, pick a page, any oh. page. Okay, now this is, let's see, this is a vegetable ravioli with truffle oil. And that's American? Well, it's influenced by the Italian. Yeah. It's the presentation, it's the ingredients. But the but presentation is the silverware and stuff, oh. or the bringing of it onto the table and everything. Well, first of all, this book is not exclusively American. I cuisine, see. Okay. And I okay. apologize. Okay. The second book, Super Chefs, is American cuisine. Now, David Burke who was very generous to me and let me test each recipe in his kitchen. Uh -huh. This is a typical David Burke parfait That's of American? salmon and tuna tartare. It is. That would be called an American cuisine? It is. It is. It's these potato gaufrette, the way they're positioned, the chive here, the layer of the creme fraiche. It's, it's, a, it's a, the essence of the whole. It's, it's an individual thing. You can't just You're say... Right. It's a whole kind of cuisine. Right, okay, and you're into art. So art is a many splendored yes. thing and so forth. But I do a lot of lifestyle books because okay, I'm interested yeah. in it. I yeah, represent a lot of decorators. Right. 
Penny Baird, she's a very prominent decorator. She's in architectural digest all the time. Mm -hmm. I just saw one of her books called Bringing Paris Home. Uh -huh. So in other words, it's not just classical French, but it's bringing it to America. Uh -huh. How you bring individual pieces to give a French feeling mm -hmm. in an American environment. Okay. So I've represented lots of decorators, uh -huh. lots of cookbooks. These are uh, artistic things like that. Then you have Floyd Abrams. Floyd Abrams. And so you I have Ben Wattenberg as a friend, and uh, he's yeah. a very well-known neocon. He's one of neocon, my so also yeah. a neocon. A lot uh -huh. of serious nonfiction. Uh -huh. As I mentioned, Alec Baldwin, uh -huh. um, Floyd Abrams, lots of different people. Now, I, I, I hope I don't know if you see it on my website at all. Oh, maybe we can bring the website but up. I'm maybe happy we can to tell people. Maybe we could bring the website up. They get, you've got your what is it, Karen? It's KarenGansLit.com. Karen Karen right. So One we'll of try the and bring that I up. I try to do. I like people. I like to share to them with them today mm -hmm. is the way to write a proposal. Mm -hmm. There's a formula to write a proposal, a really good proposal. A proposal to a publisher? To a publisher. Okay. An agent would help a writer do that? Exactly. It would help uh, do that. Right. And That's it's a, important for a writer to have an agent? You could do it yourself. Yeah. As you could find an apartment yeah, building yourself. Right. Uh -huh. An agent helps navigate the waters. Right. There are agents all over the world. It's particularly helpful to have an agent in New York because mm. the hub of the publishing business is in New York. Right. So once a week, I have lunch or have a meeting at least once a week with a publisher. Okay. And I find when you brainstorm and meet them in person, it's much, much easier to sell a book. For example, yeah. the assistant to Britney Spears gave me all these pictures that uh, Britney had uh, approved. Um, she gave me this whole big book. I called up a publisher, we made a lunch date, we showed them the pictures, I told them if they gave me a certain number that I was looking for, they would get a preemption. I a certain number, you're talking certain, money? I was looking for a certain amount of money for uh, this That would be project. what they call an advance? An advance. To the author? To the author. Okay, and then you get a, you get a percentage of that. An agent gets a percentage that. to it. Most agents get 15%. That's okay, pretty 15% Okay, 15% is about standard. Of the right? revenues uh -huh, that are generated uh -huh, from uh -huh. the publishing contract. Uh -huh. I see, okay. That was a much easier sell than most. I brought the photographs. I said I'd like an offer by the end of the day, otherwise I'll take it elsewhere. They gave me an offer. So that was your negotiating yes, technique. Yes, that was that yeah. was uh -huh. that was my negotiating technique. Uh -huh. In general, uh -huh. authors need proposals, even really well-known authors. Uh -huh. I did a book with Gloria Feld and uh -huh. Kathleen Turner. Uh -huh. We went around to publishers and pitched the project. Uh -huh. a, a a proposal was required, a, a formidable proposal. They wanted to see the writing. The critical thing is not only the concept, right. but the execution of right. the concept. How well they put the language together. Yes, yeah, and uh -huh. so most. Almost always, a publisher requires a sample chapter mm -hmm. and a formidable table of contents. Uh -huh. And I do help them mm -hmm. do all of this. In Virginia Woolf's day, you could send a manuscript to a publisher and would just get published. Today, you need a formidable marketing plan. Uh -huh. You have to do the work for the publisher, what their marketing department would normally do. You have to find competitive titles. Why titles. don't they do that? Because they have a certain limited staff. Mm -hmm. And they feel that you as an author need to show them that you're part of a team. Isn't it often somebody who's really good at something artistic like writing or something or not very good at, uh, it's a business? Very, it's a very not good very question. Good at That's it, you why know? they hire someone like That's myself. That's why they need, a creative people a need lawyer. attorneys and things. Is that it? They're yes. creative, the really creative people. Isn't it true if you get to a thing where you become very well known, you know, you're very well known, that you can almost write your own ticket when uh, Mr. Clinton wrote a book or somebody or Miss Clinton, they can get great advances because they're famous and they know that the books are going to sell because they know the market. How well do we know what something's going to sell? How easily can we predict if there's going to be sale? And the advance is, dip is it predicated upon the anticipated sales, I would presume. It is. All right. There's a profit and loss analysis that mm -hmm. the publisher undertakes. They rarely share it with the agent. Therefore, of course, the agent can share it with the author. Sometimes publishers are willing to pay a major advance in order to secure a particular contract. For example, when I worked on this Cato Kalin book during the OJ case, the advance did not earn out. Mm -hmm. They didn't earn enough money, but the, the, the author got a significant fee. I don't know whether President Clinton's advance earned out, 
but he got an incredible amount of money. He did. The publisher was very happy to have secured that. And they were uh, they were lined up trying to get him to sign on with them. That's a different thing. If you're, it's like Tiger That's Woods is an different. Auction. Tiger Woods is different than a run-of-the-mill uh, a golf player. Totally different. Right. So it's the same in writing. Right. If you're uh -huh. a celebrity uh -huh. at that level, uh -huh. you have what's called an auction. Uh -huh. An agent helps the writer put a pro some kind of proposal together, even if it's shorter than the, the standard one. Uh -huh. And as I mentioned, I'm sh very happy to share with the audience, uh -huh. yeah. my submission guidelines on my website. Yeah, if so we could bring it up. Let's see if we can bring up the website. It's uh, there in the, uh, I don't know if they're having trouble getting the website up, but you have on your website, it's a very rich and very well put, there it is. It's a very rich one and you have there, you're bringing you, is that the page that you want now specifically? My glasses on. I know, you need glasses <laughs> and so forth. No, well, it's it's an arrow further over. These are there's some of the there's upcoming There's Mr. Baldwin. Titles. There's Mr. Mr. Baldwin. Baldwin. Those are some of the coming titles. Some right? of the coming titles uh -huh. that are coming out this and next year. And now this is what historical. The one under it is a book called Forewarned uh -huh. by um, Martin Cherkasky, who is the president of the Kroll organization, the uh -huh. security organization. Uh -huh. And uh, that was a very exciting book at the time. That was a post 9/11 book. Uh huh. And um, as you can see, the title uh -huh. and the covers uh -huh. are really critical to, um, you should scroll down. It's like, yeah, if you can scroll down, if you can, yeah, thank you, scroll yeah. down, they're scrolling down, yeah. To get, like Floyd Abrams, mm -hmm. his book is called Speaking Freely. It's there you go. It's a beautiful cover. Right. Very, very it's sparse, really, but really good, yeah, you'd really think good. think yeah. the publisher could come up with the title and cover later in the process. Mm. The more an author can do at the beginning, the bigger advance he or she will get. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. If someone comes up with a title, like Floyd Abrams, Speaking Freely, a yeah. wonderful yeah, a great title, title yeah. that is a it's broad title that yeah. appeals to a, a broad group of people, right, a right. publisher will often give a larger advance. I would think so. It's part of a marketing it's campaign. Exactly. Yeah, right, right. And it's so part I of think Working on a marketing campaign mm -hmm. with a business type mm -hmm. agent is mm -hmm. really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. You need to write out where the book can sell, what kind of speaking engagements that you might be able to generate sales from the book. Uh -huh. um, I'll give an example. This, is the, this yeah. is the author of the book is presenting this kind of a thing yes, to the potential the publisher? To the that? publisher. Okay. Yes, as I and was saying. And the agent helps in that process. The agent helps to do that and okay. guide them uh -huh. and teaches them how to go about it, how uh -huh. to find competitive mark books, uh -huh. um, who their photographer will be, who will write jacket blurbs for uh -huh. them, uh -huh. if what kind of access to the press they have if they know you right. and they uh -huh. write that in their proposal, uh -huh. they yeah. will... The, the publisher will, yours will perk up a little bit yeah. because if they know that they can be on a program like yours and talk about your, their books mm -hmm. and have potential sales for their mm -hmm. books, mm -hmm. that's very appealing to a publisher. Yeah, it's all part of a it's marketing a thing, marketing really, plan. is what it is. Yeah, and then you've got the writers, and then you have writers, let's say you've got writers that are, uh, Van Gogh is an example in art, mm -hmm. right? He painted all those paintings, Right. never sold one, couldn't sell one. He tried to, Theo, sell a painting, couldn't sell one. They used one to block a window in a chicken coop. <laughs> and it didn't have any value until they fetched $35 million at Sotheby's. So the artist usually, or let's say the, the struggling artist, or the artist who's it creative in the garret. Is that a thing of the past, that the artist, does the system recognize the real art that is being out there in the society? A lot of writers think that they've got a really beautiful style or something, and it's just not recognized because they're ahead of their time or that sort of thing, or avant-garde It's less things. so today How do we deal because with those of the access to the press. Right, For okay. example, Frank Stella. There are many books yeah. about him. I've uh. talked to him many times yeah. about doing a book, but other people have written books about his work. Uh -huh. um, he did a whole Moby Dick series. Mm -hmm. Someone analyzed that, different uh -huh. parts of his work. Uh -huh. He's exhibited at museums all over the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they have access to the press, yeah. articles about their shows, uh -huh. uh, videos. You know, it's a new world in which we live. Although the book business is a $25 billion business. $25 billion, billion what? Worldwide? Worldwide. $25 billion. billion dollar. 
worldwide business. It, it, it's still very that hard to get That includes all academic sell. stuff and everything. Because there's a huge market with the academic yes. books. You got a you got a captive audience right. and everything. Right. That's true too. Uh, that that's important. And, but you know, because of the technological world in yeah. which we live in, it's very hard to sell a book. There are iPods and there's the internet and right. you can download books and download this and watch television. Yeah. And get yeah. excerpts and so it's and also the whole yeah, they, concept they, of print on demand. Right. In Jason Epstein, I think. Yes. Yeah, he's done really stuff on that. He, is. he, he really is. He's a very it's creative, innovative. You're in uh, touch with him and that. I and know publishing Jason on demand. and yeah. his wife Judy Miller. I do know them. And he's 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 tracking the uh, the the ten and also we're moving as you said into multimedia now. We haven't had that. You know, we've had three little channels with snowy pictures for a while and everything, and now the kids are all going to YouTube and they're going to multimedia rather than linear perceptions of the alphabet. We may be, uh, the kids are not reading as much. They're not, or, or the, the tendency to put st stress upon linear perceptions that even down to the ideas of what is rational based on the alphabet, because that's all we've had to communicate. We had a few paintings in churches, but it was only the alphabet. And we're transcending that now. We're getting back to a multimedia, multisensorial perception. People are interested in movies. You, you're not thinking about uh, agency for movie makers, well, yes. documentaries, multimedia, or are you strictly literary writers? No. Mm. When I get an author who, mm. whose book is available for movie rights, for example, mm. I'm representing a legal thriller called Death Witness by Paul Batista. Mm -hmm. It gets option for TV or film. I do the option agreements for them. You do? Okay. Yes. It's mm -hmm. important to have a lawyer there. It is very uh -huh. important. And then uh -huh. I hire a sub-agent, a film agent to work with. Uh-huh. So it, yeah. hopefully their book becomes a film or a TV show Isn't and there's potential to make lots more money for the author that way. Right. And I think that's the leading edge now is the idea of getting a, a Hollywood option or an option on a film or a television thing. That's the leading thing in terms of expressing the human expression of things more than the print. Well, it does seem that the film world does have a significant impact. For example, Nora, Nora so. Ephron's Heartburn. Yeah. She wrote her book first. Yeah. When she wrote her, the script yeah. to the film, uh -huh. everybody knew about what her husband had done to her while she was pregnant. And it I have no idea, but that's okay. Uh, I mean, anyway. the only there has to be some, do, you know, dolts in the business. Right, but, yeah. but the yeah. thing is, the movie had a more significant impact on a broader group of people. Yeah. Even though the book had already come out. There, so no. yes, it does. It has, and many people learn about Shakespeare from yeah. movies. Not Romeo to me. Romeo and Juliet. Right, right. Even um, non-movie you're talking about in terms of iPods. My daughter just finished Julius Caesar for school. They uh -huh. read it at school. The teacher said they could listen to an audio cassette while they were reading. It was uh -huh. okay. Uh -huh. She downloaded the book, you know, paid for it on her on, right directly onto her iPod. Uh -huh. So it took away. She A didn't reading? Have to Somebody reading the book? Someone it? reading the book. So oh, it's not oh. so away from actual reading, uh -huh. even though in the past you would just read it on your own. Yeah. But Shakespeare requires inflection. Yeah, sure. And iambic pentameter. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, Lawrence so Olivier was pretty good, wasn't very he? Very helpful yeah. to hear someone like that uh. read it with great expression. You know, so I heard... Oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 I was, I was just, just going to say, somebody told me of Sorensen, I mean, uh, no, not Sorensen, Barons, he's an uh, audio expert, that they now are getting down to where with the technology, they can take the voice, say uh, Orson Welles or Sorensen mm -hmm. Olivier, and Winston Churchill. They can take that voice, they can record it, and they capture his voice. Mm -hmm. Then they can put other words through the machine and it will come out in his voice. That is a fascinating that, new that, that's phenomenon, That's something that's new there. Is there. Now you see, that's the thing that could be used to get the good narration and so mm -hmm. forth with the words. But the thing is, it's happening. Are you involved in the leading edge of multimedia deal making and so forth? Yes, and definitely. do the agencies, uh, they have large agencies, and then they have, um, are there, is there, is there a hierarchy of the agency world and so forth? Is there, like we do in PR, you know, we have great big PR or agencies or law firms or something. There are is some the really big ones. Is it the same in terms of agency? They have mm -hmm. William Morris. William Morris, is an ICM, agency. Creative Artist. There are a lot of really Those big. Those are the big ones. Yes, right? and someone, uh, a celebrity, for example, who has their agent as a film agent there, then could turn over their author 
their celebrity to their book division. Uh -huh. So then someone would have one company representing multiple interests of theirs, and that's one possibility. With a small company, uh -huh. I have a few people who work for me, you get a lot more individualized attention. Uh -huh. But then you don't have a film department yeah. and a foreign rights department, right. and so if you go to a big agency, yeah. You'll, well, you'll just, you know, it really is an What are the economies thing. of scale in that? I mean, are economies of, you know, uh, the advantage? That is it like, um, like Ben Bagdikian? I don't know if you, he said that we used to have about 55 major companies in terms of communication. Mm -hmm. It's now down to about five or six. They get 95% or 85% of mm -hmm. what we hear, see, and read, and so forth. I don't it's know down the to a few, and the, the, per, the, the smaller and smaller companies with much and much more power, more and more concentrated attention. And those large companies with all kinds of subdivisions and so forth and advantages and it's all Rolodex connection, that sort of thing, is it getting down to where it's all, all of the literary output or the visual output or the mu movie is being done by smaller, uh, a smaller number of very large entities and that kind of thing and the small people are being cut out or Not as what's much the role in this for business. the independent? If you read on Jeff even Herman to, on has even a guide to every year, who? a guide to literary agents, okay. Jeff Herman. It's, okay. a, it's a wonderful compendium. More entries are individuals and small agencies rather than large ones. Well, there are more of them. There are more But the market ones. share is less. I mean, the market share is more and more. It's just like in the media. Mr. Murdoch's about to buy the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, and it's getting concentrated in smaller, smaller number of it's hands. It's not true of literary agents. You but don't it think is, so? It is true but of literary, the publishing world. Literary, literary, the literary world is being subsumed by the media world because the thing you're doing is not writing the book. That's not the mm -hmm. thing. It's the getting the movie, and it's it's just a it's just a prelude to a movie and a multimedia presentation or television. That's the thing that really drives the business, isn't it? more or less, and writing is sort of a thing that's being subsumed by the multimedia? That's true. So maybe they leave a space for the writer because they're not relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. well, or that, that process isn't relevant, I except understand as a what way to get into the multimedia. It's true in the big corporate leaks, world, though. There, there are just several companies that own all these different imprints now. And uh -huh. there are a lot of foreign companies, Bertelsmann uh -huh. and a French company, Hachette, taken over uh, Time Warner and Little Brown. Mm -hmm. and lots and lots of imprints under that so it is true but you can submit multiple proposals to even imprints of a same company today okay, which wasn't the case in the past okay. the courtesy was not to do that uh -huh. but because there's so many imprints and there're just uh, several mega companies you yeah. can now submit proposals to different people under one umbrella uh -huh. and there's more and more subject areas that are really able to be writing the human society seems to be very, very creative. Darn it, if they weren't so creative, we wouldn't have all that problem with the many Thank projects goodness. that are worthwhile. Yes. And there's a lot of people who go unnoticed, in even though they got a tremendous amount of uh, really great skill and great things to say. Isn't it it's true? It's very, very yeah. hard to get a book published. It I is. wanted to go back to more that. More so than it used to be? Yes, much yeah. more so uh -huh. because of all the competition that right. we've been discussing uh -huh. here today. All the more reason you need a good agent. That's right, all right. the more reason you need a good agent uh -huh. because they help you maneuver all these different avenues. Uh -huh. And as you said, even with an audio book, that's a part mm. of a contract, uh -huh. who's going to read your book? Is yeah. it the actual actress uh -huh. or actor? Is there someone, like for Harry Potter books, Jim Dale, the actor who yeah, reads all of those? But it's really important to have a good voice on mm. the audio. But this thing where they can capture the voice, is that, that is true. That's a new phenomenon. It's a wonderful I thing, and I th I'm sure they'll perfect but it But isn't there going to be some sort of uh, uh, intellectual property right about my vo uh, voice? I mean, if somebody's got, w you get Winston Churchill and you make it sound, the narration comes out sounding like Winston Churchill. There must be an intellectual property right we'll there somewhere that's going to that. be Well, protected. since he's dead, it's, it's, less, it's, it's more complicated with someone who's alive. But in well, general... Well, Tom Hanks or somebody who's con, you know, they can just capture the voice and then put your own well, words into it. you cannot take someone's name or likeness for commercial purposes without permission. What about his voice? They're, that's the part of their likeness. Okay. So right. he'd yeah. have to approve and be willing to go along with that. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. otherwise it would be a theft of And that's important because rights. there would be rights to, and, and income flow that would go to him because that's he's true. got a trademark thing. or something. Absolutely. And, you have, and that's why you need, it's really good to have an agent, if I may suggest, that's also well trained in the law. It's very Correct? helpful to Intellectual me, property rights are important. Mm -hmm. You have to uh, be aware of all well, the implications Well, as of I that. said, I do all aspects yeah, of the contract. Right, right. If a company goes bankrupt, you have to know whether it can be 
help taken out of the estate or kept in. Uh, there are lots of lots of issues, um, indemnifications. For example, mm -hmm. most publishers retain final approval rights over the title. I always over fight the title. for that. Yes, yeah, really, it, that's it's not fair uh -huh. because there really should be mutual agreement over the title. Uh -huh. I'll give you an example. I represented Stanley Kaplan. Uh -huh. The publisher had final approval rights, and they called the book Test Pilot. He right. nor we both did not like that. Uh -huh. We both fought it, but they said, sorry, we have final approval rights over the title. That's written in the initial contract? Or? It is in the contract. Yeah, right. But yeah. most publishers will not negotiate that, even with a very prominent person. Like he, yeah. Even with President Clinton, for yeah. example, they will argue, well, we're giving $10 million. We should have the final say. Our marketing department is in a better position <coughs> to know what will sell. It's a buyer's even, market? Yes. Yeah, so uh -huh. even President Clinton. Mm -hmm. So it's even if the, the bigger and bigger the advance, the less likely they'll do that too. But often when a person has more leverage, yeah. there are things that they can negotiate. For example, if he said to the publisher, I want final approval rights. If you're not going to give it to me, I'm going to the next publisher. If he's got someone so he can go he would, to. If he and does, if he's really a star, like he that, can. Yeah, there's he a, could. It's a world for so the star. So if his agent yeah. helps him do that, uh -huh. and if it's... A, if it's um, but if he's a real a big real star, critical. he wouldn't need an agent. Couldn't he just do it? If he's a real, if he's Tiger Woods, he's a big gorilla. He can go anywhere. You could choose without who you want because if a you're publisher that big. will approach you. Yeah, and then right. Then you just hire a, liter hire a literary property lawyer to do your contract. Right. But there, that's relatively few. Very few I mean, people are like in that Like Tiger category. Woods or something, yeah. a star. But you have to realize they're yeah. not lawyers. They don't know how to do the contracts either. The, yeah. the publishing contracts are very sided towards the But they could set the, the terms by which they're going to do anything that they want. If they know how to do that. But if it's, they're that star It's a quality. specialized business. Right. You have to know what a standard royalty is, uh -huh. what you can negotiate and what you can't. I uh -huh. think that's why you need to hire a lawyer because there are just certain things but that, if that I know a publisher will give yeah. that I have a certain window of what right. I can negotiate. Right. Certain things are indelible to them. And, and besides, a whole but lot of I mean, a whole lot of what's going on aren't superstars on the order of Tiger Woods in the realm of golf. I mean, not aren't. every bit are not. They're right. more in a thing where there's negotiating needed mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, and that's where the agent does come in. But right. it's good you can do that. And then you select, I is it serendipity that you come to the people? They get in touch with you, that you they would like you to be your agent? It's a and combination. A, a combination of active Of my approaching people when I feel something they've said or done is newsworthy. Mm -hmm. Or other people or who just contact me because yeah. they want me to represent them. Uh -huh. I, I rec get recommended by people. Or somebody could recommend you, you, you ought to get in touch with this person. They think they're really coming. Or mm -hmm. it's that they're relevant to, they're, right. they're going to emerge as relevant. Most of my authors recommend me after they use me. So uh -huh. I often get other clients yeah. that way Good. from word yeah. of mouth. That's uh -huh. true. There's a lot of that goes on in mm -hmm. the professional world. You know, the, the people know that. And you've been in it for how long now? The, the, the agency thing? You started this years book. And about I Right, 15 oh. years ago, and then I practiced law before that. Uh -huh. And uh, But I love this area of intellectual property. Uh -huh. I was always interested in, I wrote an op-ed piece on the California Art Preservation Act, mm -hmm. giving the right to prevent the distortion mutilation of an artist's work. That's good. Yeah, yeah. so that's mm -hmm. very exciting. I think that's probably the original intent behind a lot of that, is that you... You, you can't vitiate the intellectual integrity of what the person's doing, apart which from the economic considerations. Which is there why always. I was with Ellie Wiesel yesterday, uh -huh. and one of the reasons his books have never become optioned for film or TV is that he would lose control because a film is an amalgam of people, directors, yeah. producers, paying a lot of money. Yeah. And he would not want the integrity of his work jeopardized. Mm -hmm. So there are people who are purists mm -hmm. who would rather not have their books made into movies right. unless they could keep that kind of control. It would be good if everybody in the world could have that kind of control over the affairs of their life, that they had complete integrity and control over the use of their... That would be a good world, wouldn't it, if it was in like way, that for everyone? But one of the things I wrote about yeah. in the California Art Preservation Act is there are lots of areas in society where you cannot control your own property. Unfortunately. Right? For yeah. example, zoning laws. Right. If you live on Fifth Avenue Eminent domain now or someplace you use, else, yeah. that's yeah. another one. Well. You can't change the exterior of your building yeah. because society is saying we have a superior interest to you. Mm -hmm. Zoning laws. Yeah. 
intellectual property the artist they're saying your work your monet is so valuable to mm. society it mm. represents our patrimony our cultural heritage yeah. that you can put a red dot in that stream yeah. even though your couch is red uh -huh. even though you paid millions of dollars for that uh -huh. because society has a higher interest than your interest yeah. so yeah. i think that's good yeah it seems as if your rights are constricted uh -huh. but for the better good of society and a civil society uh -huh. and a si society where we value people's contributions. Yeah, every if we, if we value everybody's contributions and that sort of thing, and uh, that that that's something that's needed. And the agent plays an important role, particularly for the, some of the creative elements that do that and have a particular interest in that. And I thank you for sharing some of the insights with how that's done. And then there are others you're familiar with, others around the city and around the world that provide that kind of a. Uh, a nurturing context for the writers and so forth. And thanks a lot for coming in. I really appreciate it. We've run out of time for this segment. It was a pleasure to be with yeah. you. Thank you. Is there anything else that we didn't cover that we could cover in about 30 seconds? You could use haiku. You could use a haiku poem or some sort of a thing that we didn't cover that we could go, we could mention. The only thing I could say is where I met you at a press party I was yeah. having in my home, that's a new trend. Publishers aren't putting money up to have these press parties anymore. So uh, it is a trend having them at individuals' homes. Yeah, it's Where it's nice. more intimate. You really get to know the author. Yeah. The press is right there with you, uh -huh. televising, picturing it, uh -huh. and writing about it. So yeah. I think I would say that is a new trend. It's a trend yeah, to it's have a more personal book approach. parties yeah. that, like that. Uh, that's part of the, um, well, that was a wonderful event. You had a great group of people there. And then there, I and it's a social event. It's like a salon almost. Really or there used is. to be a salon, and that's beginning to happen more and more. That people are having these things, and the publishers are backing off from doing that. They used to do that sort of thing more they than they do now. They don't want to expend a lot of money. Is on that the an indication parties. of their uh, the difficulty with the industry? Is that an indication of the difficulty with the book uh, publishing industry? Is that an indication of uh, all of the above? All of the above. All of the above. And the what is emerging then in terms of the prominent method of communication within? Our, am I right in saying it's it's multi? It now is we, my haven't hope even, we haven't we haven't even people mentioned. People will continue reading. There's some something sacred about a book. You think there's something sacred That's about a book? That's why I'm in this business. Uh -huh. you think I want people to read. Uh -huh. I want them to pull out a book or a magazine while they're on a bus or a subway rather than pulling out their, getting their iPods out or their Blackberries. Yeah. And you, I believe in it. Uh -huh. You have to hope and pray that people will continue reading there's sacred words and learn about life from the way great writers have expressed their thoughts and feelings about the world. Okay, that's a, that's a, there, there's a great deal of support for that idea. I mean, literacy and reading is a, uh, well, some people say sacred cow in terms of the society and the institutions. The institutional structures are all set up on the metaphor of the, of the phonetic alphabet. Uh, Marshall McLuhan said that was the basic organizing assumption was the phonetic alphabet, right down to the assembly line mm -hmm. and all of our business organ, right down even to what is rational. You're a true Renaissance man. What am I? Yes, I don't you know are. what I am. I'm just saying that that was a that was a thing. I think I have more of a feeling for the kids coming along with the multimedia. I don't know. I'm not so sure the reading is so important when you can translate it into all the. And we haven't even mentioned the um, the internet, which is emerging as the basic sort of DNA for communications and so forth. And there are a lot of opportunities there for democratic expression. And what we really ultimately want is to have as many possible people ultimately realize their full potentiality in terms of helping to communicate ideas and thoughts and so forth with the widest number of people and even the creatures if necessary in order to bring about a world of peace and justice. And that's something that we have as an ultimate goal, I presume. Very nicely said. Very nicely said and very nicely you participated in this program. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really Carol. a pleasure. And it's Karen Gantz. Help me on the last name. Zaylor. Zaylor. I'd like to meet him. He's a good fellow. I've seen him, he's, him on TV, and he gave a talk on leadership that was really good. He's a very nice. articulate fellow. But anyway, your pleasure to have had her perceptions. Our pleasure was to attend her book party, which was really a very great event. And our pleasure to talk some about agency and the system of communication. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you, Karen, for coming in. Great pleasure. Thank you.